Hi, it's Bridget. Welcome to Above Life Channel. The purpose here is to inspire your spirit and to fill you with hope. Today we have a special guest from the afterlife, one who has an incredible spirit and legacy. We're going to be having a conversation with Anne Frank. Now, Anne Frank sounds familiar to you if you've read her diary, as I well did in, uh, in middle school, you know her story. Her and her family went into hiding to escape persecution from the Nazis during World War II and the Holocaust. And she, her sister, and many of her family members actually died. Her father, though, however, did live on past World War II and um, lived a full life. So. You know the story of Anne Frank and her family, along with some other family friends hiding out in a attic, right? So today's conversation, I want to, I have a few questions that I'd like to ask her specifically um, about her experience actually as, as her life was, was changing and, and the, the um, trauma um, there's a part, I don't know how to even say this, you guys, it's, it's, it, this is a difficult, difficult topic and it's very important to have this conversation. And so I do have a couple of questions I want to ask her about the concentration camp. Um, and I want to ask her, oh gosh, I don't even know. This is just, oh, it's so weird because I don't want to be disrespectful and focus on the trauma but at the same time she's like Bridget just ask me what you want me to want to ask me it's really okay everything's okay to ask all right thank you she just instantly just shows right up like she's like boom right here like in a little chair across from me and a very smile a big smile is how I would describe her beaming she feels like she has this light coming from her and um, big eyes too in, in curious eyes, I would say. That's how I would describe her. And it's hard to believe because you were so young when you, um, when you were uh, murdered. Let's just say that because that's exactly what happened. And um, this is just such a, it's, it's so, it's like um, when I connect in with this energy um, during that, that horrible time in history, I feel the, because of the spiritual connection, their connection to religion, there feels like an especially powerful quietness that comes over me, which is unusual, as viewers would attest to. So I, forgive me for being bumbling with my words. I want to capture the essence of that light and and acknowledge you and many, many other stories like yours and honor the spirit of you that has lived on long after your physical human life has ended. And your life is not about your death. However, for many, because of the Holocaust, there is a defining point that is shared and a collective sorrow and shame from the rest of the world. Because of the circumstances, I can't, you guys, I can't even, I don't even know how to talk about this. She said, Bridget, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to be uncomfortable. You should be uncomfortable. I mean, it's really an awful, awful thing. It's awful. I intended, Anne, to talk about your life, to talk about your great personality and the incredible talent and skills that you had as a communicator, as an author. And let's, let's start there, let's start there. Maybe I can get myself into this channeling in, in that regard. And, and let's start there, let's talk about that, your writing, your diary. Do you believe that? Okay, so what would have happened if the Holocaust would have ended and um, you were liberated and you lived on. What would have happened to your diary? What, what do you believe? Do you believe it would have still had the kind of impact? Because it seems like a huge part of your legacy, but it's, it's like you are the voice for uh, hundreds of voiceless. 
And there's this common theme, this common understanding of struggle and of hiding and of incredible, insurmountable odds and suffering, and then all these other people who tried to help as best they could. So the humanity of things comes out. I did read your diary, the diary of Anne Frank, when I was in eighth grade, and I can't even remember any of it. Maybe I should read it again, huh? I can't remember any of it. I just remember the impact that it had on me, and that was when I discovered that I was a writer. I was creative, and it came out of me, and I wrote papers about, um, it was assigned in our English literature class, and then I, I read a book about Sobibor, and I wrote about that, and I had, that was when I discovered I was, I, like, the creative channel, you know, the creative energy of the writing and, and how it's so important and it matters so much. And I got such amazing grades like I'd never gotten before. And I just was so, I was a channel. And, and it really moved me and touched me and changed me as an eighth grader. That's like 14 years old, you know? And I know you're like 13 when you got your diary, you know, I know that. I mean, I know a few things. I have a few things that I, that I know of. So, what do you think? Would you have had the legacy? What would have happened to the diary? You know, that's a good question. She said, that's a good question. I don't think I've been asked that before. I don't think it would. Do, the question really is, 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 would it have made as big of an impact? And I can only say that I wrote it for me, for my sanity. And to find some way to have kind of a normalcy around what, what we were experiencing, it was awful, but it was reality. It was all I could, could do was to know what was right there, right in front of me at that moment and watching each person around me go through the, the waves of emotions and through their own experiences, being overwhelmed with, with grief for themselves when we found out that friends of ours had been deported and hearing the air raid sirens and, and feeling the, the sheer uncertainty of, of our lives and then feeling accountable for all these other people with your behaviors and actions. So if you were too loud, if you ate too much, if you, I mean, it was so, it was difficult to live in such a confined space with so many people, but at the same time, it was just reality. It was just the way it had to be. And I was really, I was very aware that the, that the adults around me were taking tremendous risk in order to try to keep us safe. And to me, that's what heroism is. That's what the, the story is about, is people helping each other and people, people, overcoming their circumstances, tra transcending is a word that you would use in your work, I, I believe, transcending their circumstances to, to realize their potential, the human potential, which quite seriously was realized at the moment that we arrived at Aus Auschwitz-Birkenau. And I know that that's a place where, that we will talk about briefly and yet, um, I know it's, it's very um, difficult, it's tragic, I, I know that. Um, can I just say to the viewers that first, when we first connected, you looked young, youthful, big smile, really bright eyes, and just a lot of light and essence, and now as you're speaking, you, you're becoming older. Like you're standing up like a young woman, like I'm interviewing, I feel like I'm interviewing a famous author, and someone who has all of these seasoned experiences behind her. So in the afterlife where you're at now or the spirit that you are now, can you help me, help us as the viewers understand how this can be that even though you died at a young age as a teenager, how all of a sudden as I'm channeling you, I can feel you kind of growing into this, this story of image legacy. I guess it's a legacy. Can you talk about that a little bit as far as afterlife context before we actually talk about some of these details about the concentration camp in your life or the ending of your life? Yes, I think it's, it's, it's true what you bring up. It, it is different for everyone. And there are many stories. There, there are so many stories and we all will identify with different parts just as we would with humans 
we would come to know and understand their story based upon a piece of our own past or experiences. It's not just about relationships, a one-on-one -on -one experience or the interpersonal communication between two people or, or a small group, social group or families. It's more about the overall meaning that is developed from such a powerful need to live on, to live past, not, not simply through an experience, so that that experience, that one part of someone else's projection upon you, circumstance, does not define the entirety of life for one person, for a generation, for a family. There are many families that were completely wiped out. There are no ancestors in the traditional sense, no generations to carry on. Many families ended, many. And in this way, you see me as continuing on, as growing up or evolving or, or encapsulating the collective wisdom. And it's true, I've become a voice for many voices, that's true. And if that is my legacy and my job role, she, there's not a right word for this, you guys, job role, voice, she's like a voice piece, then that is the fulfillment of my life. It is not in one experience that, that makes us who we are. It is who we are that makes us It is not our dependency on one another. It is our ability to become interwoven as a, a, and it looks like a web of support or something, Become to become a group of strangers who find through simple compassion the ability to connect what was maybe not connected previously. So strangers helping strangers because of humanity, a, a common knowing of what is decent and what is good and what, what sacrifices are being made and what suffering is occurring. And it's not the connection through the suffering, it's the, it's the awareness of being one. And that's what afterlife is, it's one. It's one, one being one common collective knowing. And those who choose to not know or to take the viewpoint of the entire history not even happening or occurring are feeling a very different way, siding in one way, or as opposed to the humanitarian, hu common humane true value of a human life as all value of all human life, one. Those others are not, it may very well be that they are so overcome with their own fear of their own circumstance that they do not believe in the afterlife, the eternal life of the human soul. And there is indeed that. And you and I just talking, that should prove that to many. So, are you reincarnated? I'm not sure if I should. Can I tell you that? Is that something that's allowed? It's like she's saying, is that allowed? Yes, there are actually two versions of me as you are connecting with the collective wisdom and knowledge of the, and guys, it looks like a big circle and there's all these other pieces inside of her energy collective. So yes, you're speaking to me to the soul of me, yes, as it is a voice piece, as you said, mouth piece. And yet there is another part of me that is having human experience or has recently had as a grandmother. And that is what I will say about that. So there are two viewpoints of me, yes, and two ways to access me, yes. Yes. Okay. 
Oh, that just feels good, you guys. Warm and fuzzy to know that Anne Frank is reincarnated and she's a grandma. <laughs> so cool. Okay. <clears throat> so, I would like to speak to you about <clears throat> going to Auschwitz and being captured or being discovered. Can you talk a little bit about your state of mind or your thoughts during that experience? Well, we knew. We knew what was happening. We knew what was going to happen. You don't, you, your mind doesn't want you to believe it, but your body is in denial. You're moving, but you feel very, very heavy. My legs and my feet felt so, so heavy, and it was um, very rough and very crude and very quick, and the leaving of the attic, like she's showing me everybody, you know, leaving the attic and having to leave everything behind and just go and She shows me saying goodbye to people. So I don't know if they were already separated, the people that weren't families, but she's showing me trying to stick with her sister and, and stick close to her, her parents and as they're moving through the streets and they're going to some kind of gathering place or meeting place and then the man that was with them and then the other like two people, families, they're different. They're, all, they're not all together. They're different, they're different. I don't know if they're sent to different places, and yes, we end up in different places. Yes, our fates are different. It wasn't unexpected. I think we all knew it would happen eventually, but the timing of it is crazy because it was so close. You were so close to making it until the end of the war. So I know that you were um, found out in September of 1944, I believe, is that right? Yeah, 1944, and that the end of the war was in 1945. Like liberation was in 1945, different camps were liberated. I mean, it was so close. It, did it feel like a betrayal? You know, at, at first, there's a lot, there's anger, but it's really more about denial. It's more about realizing that your fate is in someone else's hands. And, and as a, a young person, you don't, you just feel hurt. And at the same time, as more of an adult perspective, there is this um, wisdom of knowing that it was simply a matter of time and that there's a feeling of gratitude for what we had, even though what we had was so little and just cramped and just challenging. It was something that we had and others never had that. So how could I be mad that my family lived together for a longer period of time and was together, wherein others were not? They didn't even have that choice. How can I be angry about the time I did have with my family? We were sent to Auschwitz and we knew what Auschwitz was. We knew about the concentration camps. We knew about these death camps. We knew, we knew. We didn't realize, I don't think anyone really wanted to believe how horrible it really was. I think there was a f false hope of it being simply working, you know, that you would be like slave labor and you would have to work really hard and, and as long as you didn't get sick or um, didn't do anything bad or misbehave that you would you know, survive. There wasn't this understanding that the purpose of the camps wasn't well understood. And I think it's because you, in, in your human mind, in a human mind, you can't even imagine that other humans would even treat others like that, that that could even be a real, uh, thing or even even I mean you can't even imagine something like that it and yet the Jews as a scapegoat were used as a, a pawn were used as just target and but you don't see yourself as just a Jew you see yourself as a person as a living breathing human being and knowing that Others determined that you're not, there's no value to you, then it's so the opposite of what you know, what you believe. 
it, it, you can't even allow yourself to believe what really a concentration camp is or means. We were separated early on. I'm seeing, I know that you and your sister were transported eventually to another camp in 1945, um, that the two of you went together to that place, and but the rest of your family, I'm not sure about. Um, it, I can see, she says, Munch, Munchhausen, Munch, Munchhausen. And um, so her dad went one place, which may very well have saved his life, is what she's showing me. And then her, he must have some kind of skill or something that was useful. And then she's showing me that the others were, somebody was, the others killed instantly is what I see. So gas chamber or shot. Somebody was shot. It doesn't matter. The details of it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's hard to see, I know. And, and it doesn't matter. The way you die doesn't matter, except for the fact that it does. When it is so catastrophic that you can't even, your, your mind, as you're receiving the information, you can't even process that it's even real. It looks like a, a horrible movie. It's not. It was real. It was all real. Very real. We went for work. Um, she says, we went for work. The Germans knew that they were not doing well in the war, and some of us were transported to other pockets. She's showing me other pockets. She doesn't say places, other pockets. And... Yeah, it's interesting because when I felt into you right away, I thought, oh, you, you died at Auschwitz. That's what I thought right away. Oh, you must have died at Auschwitz. And because I saw the gas chambers and I saw that right away. And that must be because some of your family died that way. Yes, they did. Did you know? Yes, we knew. We had heard of gas chambers. We had heard of these things. But like I, say, like I, I said, you can't, you can't really let yourself believe that or then you wouldn't have hope. How can you have hope in humanity? How can you even believe that to be po a possibility? It, it, it's even, it's unbelievable, isn't it? You can't even, it doesn't even make sense. Mm -mm. And, and I know that you and your sister then died right before the liberation and you died of typhus um, disease. Mm -hmm. Yes. It looks like you died first, is that true? Yes. And then she died, yes. She said, I was hallucinating in the last time. I couldn't, I didn't know it was real and what wasn't. I had, I had these visions of my mother. She was baking bread and it was a beautiful summer's day and it just, you know, it smelled good, all the smells. You could just smell everything. All of my senses were activated, you know, active. I'd have these beautiful hallucinations, you know, images of my mother, and I don't know that I knew I was dying. I knew my body wasn't functioning. And it's not that I wanted to die. I wanted very much to live, very much to live. I was quite determined, actually. And then I had this moment. It looks like an angel, you guys this moment of a choice and I could go and be in the sun and in the grass and with all of those warm, warm days, you know, it was, it was cold where I was and it wasn't warm and it wasn't loving or kind or, and I went. And that's how it was. At the end, it wasn't a struggle. It was simply a, a choice. And then all of the rest of it was not a part of me, of my story, my choice, my lifetime. It was simply ex a string of experiences that I had that were common to many other stories in many other camps and many other parts of Europe at the time. 
Why was my story chosen? I don't know that it stood out in any particular way. I did enjoy very much writing, and it was fun creating characters of myself and my family and thinking of things that were so much different. You know, daydreaming, it's, it's what saved me. It's what kept my spirit alive. And sharing all the things wasn't intended as a documentation, but more rather to keep my sanity in, in a timeline of things, to allow my thoughts to be held someplace without being overwhelmed or overcome by them because you could be made mad in such a confined space for such a long period of time knowing that the world outside was so much worse than what you actually could allow yourself to believe it to be at those times, you know. I didn't write my diary for the world to read or know. I wasn't that bold. I have been imbued with courage and given many distinctive honors that are not just, that are not my own. If I could, I would dedicate. If I had a book that I, I wrote and I lived out to see it published, I would dedicate it to my family and to all the other families that were like mine and to thank those sympathizers who helped support us during the times when we needed it most. We could have starved to death. We could have died without those brave individuals helping us. And I understand I'm not angry. There is, there is complete and total forgiveness to the people that turned us in. It was more than one person and they did so out of fear. Unfortunately, their lives did not end well either. But I don't blame them and I'm not angry with them, no. I'm not upset. It was bound to happen eventually. With so many people in hiding everywhere, it was bound to happen eventually. Is there a message or anything in particular you'd like to say to the viewers here at Above Life Channel? Anything about life, your life, our lives, the meaning of life? Yes, <clears throat> I will. What you do matters. What you do matters. It doesn't have to be big. It can be just small. But what you do matters. The worst thing that can happen to any one individual person or a country or a people's is to become prisoners of fear. The intimidation tactics of the Nazis and the many others that brutalized the Jewish people along with many other sympathizers can only exist when there's fear. Don't be afraid. That would be my, my best advice to you. Don't be afraid. Don't let others intimidate you or change you or control your thoughts, your beliefs. Then life is not worth, it's not worth living then. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you for being here and sharing your messages. Thank you for my patience, everybody, all the viewers at Above Life Channel as I stumble and bumble through the beginning of this particular channeling video. It's not an easy conversation to have, but it's important. And although Anne Frank died in the Holocaust of natural causes, Let's be honest. This is one case where I'm actually channeling someone who was murdered. 
not just by one person or a group of hoodlums or bad people, but by an entire nation, a belief system, and a culture of hate fueled by fear. So I am going to take an opportunity to honor this connection to Anne Frank in the afterlife, and I'm going to journal a bit about her message. When I go back over this video, and I encourage you to do, the, to do the same, to listen to her closing statement and maybe journal about it. Take it to heart. Use it. Use the wisdom. This is Bridget with Above Life Channel. Thank you so much for being here.